I welcome you to worship this morning. Um, for those of you who uh, might be at home, um, we welcome you to watch us on uh, Facebook, the church website, or um, some YouTube. Thank you. <laughs> Just a reminder that uh, the chicken and biscuit uh, dinner at Columer is back on, and it's next Saturday. And is a, it is a drive-through um, situation, and uh, so if you're able to get back into doing that, I'm sure they would appreciate it. We're also still collecting items for the VA hospital, and there's a box in the narthex. If you have items that you uh, can, that there's a list in your bulletin. If you can give some items and put them into that box, it would be appreciated. Parish Council will be meeting this Thursday at 6.30. I mean Tuesday. <laughs> God knows what I'm doing Thursday. <laughs> Tuesday at 6.30 in the lounge. Uh, does anyone else have any announcements they'd like to make this morning? Okay. I'm going to light the candle of remembrance and the candle <laughs> of peace. The candle of remembrance is lit for those in the military and their families veterans, first responders, and all those in harm's way. And our candle of peace reminds us to pray for God's peace in our homes, community, the nation, and the world. They may not stay lit because it's a little warm in here, so we've got a little air conditioning on, so they, they may not stay lit. But if you would please join me in the call to worship. This morning it is from Psalm 90, verses 12, 14, 16, and 17. Stand as you are able, please. Oh, yes, yes. <clears throat> Lord, teach us to count how few days we have and so gain wisdom of heart. Let us wake in the morning filled with your love and sing and be happy all our days. Let your servants see what you can do for them. Let their children see your glory. May the sweetness of the Lord be upon us and make all we do succeed. Our first hymn this morning is number 126. Sing peace to God who reigns above. <laughs>
The author of the letter to the Hebrews reminds his readers that nothing can be hidden from God. Everything in all creation is exposed and lies upon God's eyes. The point is that God we pray to knows us better than we know ourselves and loves us better than we love ourselves too. That frees us to be honest with God about the things we have done, about the people we are, and about our need for forgiveness, which God is always more willing to offer than we are to receive. Keep this in mind as we join in this morning's prayer of confession. Let us begin. It is printed in the bulletin and also up in the monitor. Eternal God, in whom we live and move and have our being, we confess that we are children of dust, unworthy of your gracious care. We have not loved as we ought to love, nor have we lived as we live, and our years are soon gone. The Lord have mercy upon us, forgive our sin, and raise us to do life, so that as long as we live, we may serve you until dying, we enter the joy of your presence. Well, the same author to the letter to the Hebrews that Anne was talking about earlier offers this encouragement as well. He says, let us have confidence as we approach God in our prayers where there is grace and mercy and the help we need just when we need it. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel May the peace of Christ be with you all. And also with you. Please share with one another the peace of Jesus Christ. Sorry, Jane, I should have no, talked to you. <laughs> We're doing all right. <laughs> Go ahead, Gloria. <laughs> Well, there aren't many of you, but I'm going to need as much help as you can offer right now because I have some challenges. I mean, Halloween is coming up, so the first thing I want from you folks is show me what, what it looks like to be scared. Isn't that a good thing to know for Halloween? What does it look like to be scared? Can you show me? I, a facial expression? Scared? There it is. <laughs> That grimace is there. There we go. Okay, how about this one? What does it look like to be angry? Who can show me that one? What does it look like to be angry? 
No, they're, they're okay. They're, Greg, you're doing pretty good. I like. <laughs> you're you? Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> okay. Next, how about how about happy? Because I mean, we, we've we've been scared and angry. That's kind of negative. So, how about what does it look like to be happy? Who can show me what a face looks like? That that's that's next, Greg. Keep that in mind. That's coming up. But what does it look like to be happy? <laughs> there it is. I knew from the back pew. Yes, I knew some happy things were going on back there. How about sad? What does it look like to be sad? Yes, yes, Greg, you hit, yeah, you were practicing that one last time. That's good, yes, sad. Oh, here's a tough one. Here's a tough one. What does it look like to be curious? Curious. Yeah, those eyes from side to side, or raising an eyebrow, or, or curling the corner of your mouth. Yeah, yeah, okay. Last but not least, what does it, how, how do you look with love? What does it look like to look lovingly? That's, that is, that's a tough one, isn't it? That's a tough, there, there is such a thing I think as a loving gaze Well, how, so Dick, how do you look then when you're gazing at that newborn baby? How does that look? The, and, and I think I, I, I have a picture in my mind, but I think, I think we're having a little tr trouble reproducing it here in this context, which is okay. Because that's my segue anyway. Think about what it's like to look lovingly and then listen as Anne reads to you about a day when Jesus looked on a man with love, or Jesus looked lovingly on someone. Please, and take it. Our scripture reading this morning is from Mark, chapter 10, verses 17 through 31. As his, he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall, you shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your mother and your father, he said to him. Teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go sell what you own and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astonished and said to one another, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God, all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, Look, we have left everything and followed you, Jesus said. Truly, I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age, houses, brothers, and sisters, mothers, and children, and fields, with precautions, and in the age to come, eternal life. 
but many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. This is the word of God <clears throat> within us. Thanks be to God. This is the word of God among us. Thanks be to God. And this is the word of God in Scripture. Thanks be to God. Our next hymn this morning is number 398. Jesus calls us, verses 1, 3, and 5. Please stand as you are able. <laughs> Well, I am sure that to the disciples, he looked like all the others. Just another person seeking Jesus, coming forward, kneeling, probably hoping to be healed. I mean, they saw it on a daily basis. Here a man with a withered hand, and there another with an unclean spirit. And, and then there was that, that leader of the synagogue and his daughter, and, or the bleeding woman, or the blind man. They saw it every day. So I'd have to guess that they didn't even blink when, when this particular man came forward on that particular day. But, apparently, based on what, what Mark tells us in this text, he didn't look that way to Jesus. Jesus knew that, that something, something was different about this man. A, a difference which became obvious the minute he opened his mouth. Good teacher. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And already you can hear an unusual twist to that question because first of all, the verb, it, the verb, the, it's, it's do. Did you hear that? The verb is do, as in what must I do? And the interesting thing is, just before this passage, if you're reading the beginnings of the Gospel of Mark, just before this passage, you will have heard Jesus tell his disciples, and the crowd for that matter, the necessity, about the necessity of receiving the kingdom as a little child. But this man, he wants to know what to do what does he need to do in order to get it? And my guess is this guy was someone who was used to working hard. Who worked hard to get not only what he wanted, but what he needed, all right? And, and who can't relate to that? I think we all can. Nobody here, to my knowledge, is independently wealthy, so come on, we, we, we know what it is to have that sense that, 
that we need to do and to go and to earn in order to get. Now to add to the pressure on this man, in those days, he would have been, well, he would have been the patriarch of his family. That is, he'd have been the one in charge, the one on whom everybody else in the household depended. And that's why I imagine that every morning when the, when the alarm rang at 4.30 a.m., he, he'd get up and he'd put on his suit and his tie and he'd grab the journal and the economist as he made his way out the door as he scooted out that door, and I think you can hear him calling back over his shoulder, don't wait up for me, I'm just not sure when I'll be home today. So once again, he worked very hard to get or to earn what he wanted and what he knew his household needed, which is why I imagine as well that that question that he put to Jesus rolled pretty easily off of his lips. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Which brings us as well to the other interesting twist in this question. Because usually, I mean, you don't have to do a thing in order to receive an inheritance, do you? You don't have to do anything. All you have to do is receive. All you have to do is open your hands in gratitude for someone else's generosity continued after their death. But again, this man was not big on receiving this man was big on doing. He was a doer and therefore he was determined to do whatever it took to inherit eternal life. And had that man not been so incredibly earnest about it, I, th I think Jesus might have laughed out loud. But he was earnest. And Jesus was respectful. And so Jesus responded with a little verbal repartee like this. He said, why do you call me good? Hint, hint, hint. Why do you call me good? No one is good but, but God alone. Not even hard-working breadwinners. Even those people aren't good in the ultimate sense. After which Jesus continued by listing some of the commandments as, as images of what, what faithfulness looks like. But the guy doesn't miss a beat, does he? Jesus no sooner spins off this image of, of, of the commandments when he says, teacher, teacher, good teacher, I have done these things. These things I have done, all of them, all of my life, even from my youth, and, and in reflecting on this man's unusually high opinion of himself, one commentator on the text observes that in the whole Talmud, that's the, the written commentary on the Torah, or on, on the first five books of the Bible, in the whole Talmud, only Abraham and Moses and Aaron are reported to have kept the whole law. So this guy's putting himself in rather exalted company, and he's doing it without even batting an eye. Even so, Jesus doesn't challenge. Jesus doesn't argue. Rather, rather as Mark writes, Jesus looks at him with love. Jesus loves him. And this is where, once again, Jesus surprises with his willingness to do whatever it takes to be God with us. For in order to, to really look at this man, as Mark reports, Jesus must have gotten down on his level, must have knelt down 
just as the man had, so he could look him directly in the eye. And as he did so, he decided to speak the truth about what he saw. To put it another way, Jesus loved this man so much that he simply couldn't let him stay the same. He couldn't leave him alone. So, so there in that moment, face to face, eye to eye, he confronts this man out of love. You lack one thing, he says. And that too must have thrown this guy off balance. I mean, as far as he's concerned, if the truth be told, he doesn't think he lacks for anything. And no one in his household lacks for anything either. He worked hard to make sure of that. But then Jesus, out of love that was, I would guess, deeper than any this man had ever known, Jesus continued, sell all you have. Give the money to the poor. You'll have treasure in heaven then, and then, and then follow me. And the point is that when Jesus looked into this man's eyes, he saw. He saw that though the man was earnest in his desire to earn his way into God's kingdom and to possess eternal life, that man was equally captive to the desire to earn and to possess all that he could. You know, another commentator on this text writes that, that in this man's, that, that, that this man's weakness was his captivity to the power and principality of possessions. How's that for an alliterative phrase? The power and principality of possessions. A captivity that prevented him from, from living into the full life of God's reign, a life defined not by what one owned, but, by, but with whom one was in relationship or with whom one shared it, a life defined not by earning, but by receiving a life defined not by what you've got, but by what you give. So Jesus looked at this man, and he saw in him what William Sloan Coffin used to call the shackles of the non-economic power of money. He saw in him the power money exerts over the way in which we define who we are. And Jesus knew that unless this man was willing to, to let go of that power and its control over him, then he would never be able to open his hands to receive the whole life or the life of wholeness given to him by God. And that brings us, I think, to one really, really good reason for us to consider this text at this time. Because what month is it, everybody? It, it is October. And what goes on in most congregations in October, or at least most of the ones I've served, I don't know, if you're different, but in most of the congregations I've served, October is the time for the annual pledge campaign. Does that go on here in October? Or? Okay. <laughs> yes. Yes. October is the time when, when most, when this congregation's leaders say, We'll offer a pledge campaign. It means that they'll, they'll, the parish council will, will give you all sorts of facts and figures, hoping to secure your promise of what you will give financially to the church in 2022. Gifts which will enable you all to keep engaging in this place and with these people in ministry and mission. And these promises are crucial. And you, Are they not? Parish council can't put together a budget without your pledges. And, and because they're so important for the health 
in survival of this congregation, I could spend a lot of pulpit hours to a lot of pulpit time listing the reasons that your giving really makes a difference and recruiting others to do the same thing. But the truth is simply this, that without your financial support, nothing here happens. We all know that, all of us. But after wrestling with this passage from Mark, the church's need is not what I want you to, to think carefully about. I don't want you to think carefully about the church's need and why you might give to that. Instead, I want to recommend that you all seriously and prayerfully consider what you need to give for the sake of your soul, if you will, for the sake of your spirit. Because to me, if this passage illuminates anything, it's the truth that, that at its core, our financial giving to God's work is not about fundraising for a church budget. The act of making a pledge, the act of giving money away is primarily about what we need to do, what we need to give so we can remember who it is that we actually are. Another way to put that is to say that the challenge for us all is to honestly grapple with how much money we need to give away in order to actively resist the power of money which can so easily control our sense of self, our sense of who we are, our sense of what we dare hope for. Do you remember the old bumper sticker from a few years back, or maybe it wasn't just a few years, maybe it was 10 years or 20 years, or maybe it was 30 years back. I lose track of time. That bumper sticker which said, "Those, the one who dies with the most toys wins. It was self-deprecating on purpose. And, and, and I think when we saw it, we, we laughed because we knew then, we know now that it's wrong. The one with the most toys wins what? The ones with the most toys doesn't win more. The ones with the most toys just has the most toys. And he or she typically has to spend not only an enormous amount of time and energy and effort and money both to acquire those toys, but also to keep up with them. And the next thing the owner of, of all the toys knows, he or she can only feel truly safe and secure and loved if he or she keeps getting more toys and more things and more and more because we live in a culture which defines us all on the basis of acquisition, an economy propelled by an insatiable desire and the sense that there never is enough. It's the idea, underlying idea of scarcity. That's what drives our economy that there will never be enough money or possessions or toys, if you will. But Jesus points out to his disciples after this man leaves that how much stuff you have and how much money you do or do not earn is not what defines you. The only one who defines you is God. God is the only one who gets to tell you who you are and remind you of whose you are and who you are capable of being. But remembering that truth, as we sit in the middle of our culture of acquisition and greed, it takes real effort to remember that. It takes choosing to ground oneself again and again and again in the promise that we are loved simply because God decided for it to be so. And nothing, nothing is impossible for that God. So today I want to suggest that one way that we can keep that truth, that promise in the forefront of our minds is by choosing to be generous. 
by choosing to unclench our, our hands, stop grasping and grabbing every day in order to give instead of to take. And that's why this year, as each of you looks at your pledge card or your checkbook, I hope you think deeply not only about the amount the church needs you to give, but more importantly about the amount you need to give for your light to shine, for you to be liberated from the power that money has over you. For make no mistake, money does have power over us. We give it that power, and it is that battle that goes on in all of us over who and what tells us who we are and what we're worth that Jesus was addressing in and with this man in this passage that we read from Mark. Jesus clearly thought that this particular guy might just need to give it all away, all of it, or at least to seriously consider what it would mean to give it all away so that he could then follow Jesus freely, joyfully, as a wholehearted disciple. But judging by the man's grief, and his decision to walk away, we see that he decided the price was too high. We see that for him, the loss was too much. Apparently, sometime in the arc of his life, he decided that, that all the stuff that he had was what made him who he was. All the stuff that he had was what gave him worth, that he was the guy with the big house or the guy with, with the high-powered job, or the guy that all the charities came to for the big check, the guy that people wanted to be around because of all that he had and all that he could do for them, and he couldn't give that up. His wealth, his status, became the core of his identity. Well, we too have a decision to make. When we make it every year, when we fill out our pledge cards, or choose not to fill it out. We make it every time the offering plate comes by on a Sunday morning. Every time we try to determine the, the percentage of our income, which we need to give back to God. It's a decision we make every single day when we try our best to remember that, that God is the one. God is the one who tells us who we are and what we're worth the decision that we make when we try to turn away or let go of the power of possessions and to hold on to the power of God. So again, how much do you need to give in order to live life fully? And for Jesus, well, Jesus looks at us with the same kind of love as he looked at that man. And he gives us the same call. What will you choose? Let us continue our worship with our gifts and our offerings. Those of you here in the sanctuary this morning, there is a basket in the narthex where you can leave your gifts and your offerings. And for those of you at home, they can be mailed to 823 Franklin Park Drive in East Syracuse. <laughs> Let us pray. 
O God, we give thee but thine own, whatever that gift may be, because all that we have is thine alone, a trust, O Lord, from thee. So use what we offer, God, and use us for your purposes. In Christ's name and spirit, we ask it. Amen. Paul's got his microphone and about to invite you to share any joys or concerns that you have at this time. Since Paul has the microphone, I thought that he might invite us to share. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> okay, um, does anyone have any joys or concerns they would like to share? Lynn. I married this man 23 years ago today. Wow. <laughs> right here in this sanctuary. <laughs> and, and my question is, did he wear that same black suit when he married you? Uh, he did wear a black suit. OK. <laughs> it still fits, Bill. Yeah, yeah, it still fits. OK. Chuck, yes, I just want to uh, thank again everybody who has uh, participated in um, Mary Pat's memorial, and also a heads up on Marsha. Marsha is doing very well. Matter of fact, we have family in from Virginia. They've been in New York. They're coming in this afternoon. Family from Ballinsville, and we're going to dinner in Westvale. So thank you all for all you have done to help uh, our families. Thank you. And, and Chuck, I want to thank you, Dodger fan that you are, for not reminding us all of what the Dodgers did to the Giants last night. Because had you done that, I would have had to refer to Friday as well. <laughs> Good series so far. We'll see. That's yes. the end thank you. Who else? Oh, Ann. Let's stop with Joan first and then Ann. My grandson Colin has a big week this week, driving test on Thursday and PSAT on Saturday, so a little prayer that all goes smoothly for him. Let, let's hope he's not so focused on his PSATs that he can't drive. <laughs> all right. Good. Anyone else? Dick? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I speak I, I can never speak for Diana usually but I think I, we agree on this few words that we appreciate this ministry and this house of worship that I was never around when it was first put together but I've always enjoyed and loved coming here and I'm glad that people took the reins and got us back into this business when the pandemic started and it was kind of horrendous. So, else, um, before you finish in your stewardship business, I leaned over to my wife and I said, this guy's really good. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but stewardship, and, yeah, go ahead. And I said, he gotcha, huh? <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you brought up the term stewardship. Did you know that, that, the, that the word stewardship comes from the Old English styward? Say, my name also comes from that same root, styward, which of course is a keeper of the pigs. Which just goes to show you that stewardship always has been and always will be a dirty business. <laughs> you should invite him to join the finance committee, Anne. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay, I've got a couple of things. Uh, first, a joy that Jane Lorraine has joined us this morning to fill in for uh, Christy. We always appreciate her willingness to, to help us out. 
Um, also, my sister-in-law, Nancy, is uh, making very slow progress. She's not had to go into the hospital, and she's still staying with a friend who is helping care for her. Thirdly, you've all heard the expression, time, talent, and treasures. It's the treasure that keeps the physical <laughs> building with the lights on, heat, and air conditioning. It is the time and talent of the folks in this church who volunteer their time to do all the little things, and some not so little, that we don't necessarily always think about. And in regards to the treasure portion, keep an eye on your mailbox. <laughs> your your, <laughs> your uh, giving card will be coming soon. Thank you. I had a joy I just thought of. So two weeks ago, roughly, I celebrated my 36th anniversary with Susan. <laughs> And I just shared this morning with Jane, she played at our wedding the organ with my grandmother who sang when she was in her 80s. But I showed her, I actually had a VHS recording of it, so I filmed it on my phone and showed, shared it with Jane this morning. So, And in two weeks, less than two weeks, Ben is getting married to Christina at the Hotel Syracuse. So we're right in the middle of what happened 36 years ago and what's yet to come. Uh, so. My question is, does he have to do this in order to, to earn your, <laughs> that wedding? The answer is yes. yes. Yeah, I thought so. She got time, Ben. <laughs> God bless Susie. Thank you. She has. He has. Yeah. October 22nd was my grand, my parents' anniversary, and there was a ritual in our family, and my father would say, or my mother would say to my father, do you know what day today is? And he'd say, why, yes, it's three days before hunting season. <laughs> yeah. But a real joy is our grandson, Forrest, is, is in town. And our two grandsons, Forrest and Russell, have invited us to lunch today after church. Very At good. their house, they're cooking. <laughs> Anyone else? <laughs> what was I, anyone else? And then I hear. Phew. <laughs> okay. If not, um, I invite you to center your hearts and your minds on God once again and to join me uh, in prayer. Oh, wonder-filled and gracious God, we are grateful. We give you thanks that you have called us into being, that you know us completely, that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, and so our prayers spring to you from a mix of awe and trembling. How blessed we are, God, that you know us by name, and that when we name you, our, our fears dissolve into trust. Open our hearts this morning to your expansive love, to a deeper understanding of, of who you would have us be and, and who you enable us to become. Open our minds to yet unrealized possibilities of, of how we might serve you completely, joyfully. So often, God, we, we grasp for control, imagining that, that we create order out of chaos. But from the very beginning of time, 
that has been your gift, your task, your grace. So help us to relinquish our grasping and our grabbing to instead freely align our wills with yours where they can be transformed by the energy of our working with you and with your goodness. And then God of compassion, we offer you our hope for the healing of your fragile creation. We we seek your mercy in in lives shaken by, by earthquakes and fire, by bombs and violence, by abuse and poverty, by illness and loss, by confusion and regret. Shake us awake to our dependency on you and on your unending love. And then hear us finally as we praise you for the universe you have spun into being. For we hope against hope that that your will for creation will be realized. That evil will be overcome that as glory is glimpsed, courage will be granted at least for one more day by your grace. At least one more day aware of your sovereign love as it tends the universe and calls out our servant love in response. By your grace, God, Is all this known? By your grace do we ask for all of this. By your grace, which is made known to us in the one we call the Christ, in whose spirit we pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is found on the screen as those of old their first fruits brought. Familiar tune, Forest Green.
Go out in peace, do good, share what you have. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and always. Amen. Thank you.